uh, is, a, uh, is a very good friend of mine. I've known her for 10 years. And uh, as you probably all know, she has a lot of uh, passion uh, for spinal fluid leaks. Uh, she's the founder of the Spinal Fluid Leak Foundation. And uh, uh, she did 99% of the work uh, getting this symposium uh, done. Uh, all right, 99.9%. Not true. That's what you meant. Not true. Very nice. And I'm sorry I ate into her time slot a little no bit. No problem. Here's your water. Thanks. Yes. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, we're pretty excited about this symposium, um, getting some more education going on. Um, oh, I'm sorry. So, um, hi, everyone. Does that sound okay? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, we're pretty excited about this symposium, getting some education going. It's great to see clinicians here, patients here, caregivers here, all coming together. So um, it's a great thing. So um, what I'm going to talk about is an integrative approach for patients with intracranial hypotension. Um, I have a background as a family doctor, and I also did a fellowship in integrative medicine. So um, you know, when my practice was still open, um, the, last, the last time I was practicing, I was doing integrative um, medicine con consultations. So that's kind of the way that I approach uh, medicine. So, um, so uh, intracranial hypotension, I'm going to use the short term um, SIH um, for spontaneous intracranial hypotension just because it's easier to say. Um, but um, keep in mind that I'm also referring to intracranial hypotension from iatrogenic causes. Um, and the reason that I'm talking about this today is because um, SIH can be pretty disabling and not everyone gets better really quickly, even though most people do. Not everyone does. So sometimes there's other things that we want to do to try to improve symptoms. Um, positional headache, of course, is the main symptom that creates disability by limiting upright time. Um, some of the other symptoms can contribute to that disability, but um, for most patients that are disabled, it's the positional headache um, that's a problem. So the gap in time between onset of symptoms to diagnosis, as you know, can take some time, um, and then um, to treatment and doing better. And while most people, as Dr. Schiefing said, do very well, they may get better in a few days, weeks, or months, there is a subset of patients that um, has uh, persistent uh, symptoms and disability for years or even decades, and I fall into that category. So, um, so while waiting for better, I think um, um, as an integrative medicine physician, I think um, it's okay to focus on what we can do to improve function and uh, quality of life. So just to define integrative medicine, because I have a lot of questions about what that really is, um, I've provided for you here a, uh, an academic definition of integrative medicine um, for your reference. And basically, integrative medicine just makes use of all available therapies, has some emphasis on lifestyle approaches because the power that, that, that they have, and um, the one misconception um, that people have is that it's not based on evidence, and in fact, uh, integrative medicine is based on available evidence of effectiveness and safety. Um, so integrative medicine, in my view, is really just multimodal medicine. It's combining all the available therapies. Um, to give some context to why, to why integrative medicine um, might have value for an SIH patient who has persistent symptoms, um, I like to use the examples of hypertension and diabetes because um, we have a lot of data to tell us that if we, treat, if we treat high blood pressure and diabetes just with medications, the results are so-so. But when we combine uh, nutrition, physical activity, stress management, um, the outcomes of um, stroke, heart attack, and death um, are much improved. So that really has become the standard of care um, in mainstream medicine, um, effectively, um, integrative medicine is multimodal approaches. When it comes to pain, pain being the most common reason that um, people seek care, um, we also know that single uh, approaches may not be as, as helpful as multiple approaches combined. Um, for the longest time, 
pain management involved a pill-focused approach or a procedure-based approach. And um, for, for some people, that was enough. For many others, it wasn't enough. Um, because the sheer volume of suffering due to pain, there really has been a lot of research in the last couple of decades that's demonstrated very clearly that combining multiple therapies is far more effective. And that is why there's been a national shift over the past decade, both in um, pain management, uh, mainstream pain management physicians to use an integrative model and the um, um, public policy has also followed suit with that, as we saw with the, um, the national pain strategy that was released last year. So an integrative model is how um, pain management is, is now uh, approached. So for um, the patients that have a long gap in time between onset of symptoms and, and doing better, um, I think that an integrative approach does make sense. Um, the goals that I perceived um, for myself and for other people that I talk to are to reduce the severity of the symptoms, improve function, um, support the brain, um, help the body compensate a little bit better for the low CSF volume, and to support tissue healing. So if we're looking at um, all of the things that are being done for patients with intracranial hypotension, of course, as an anatomic problem, the mainstay of treatment is really focused on treating the underlying problem, anatomic problem, anatomic fix. But when that uh, takes time to get there, um, using all of the tools in the toolbox, I think, has some value to uh, reduce suffering. So I'm going to talk about today is um, a little bit about nutrition, supplements, physical activity, and mind-body approaches that can um, make a difference. I'd like to talk about everything, but there isn't enough time. Um, and before I dive into the nutrition part of, of this talk, um, I do want to mention that fatigue and brain fog are pretty commonly reported in SIH patients. Um, and it's all too easy to attribute those symptoms entirely to the intracranial hypotension. But in fact, sometimes there's some other underlying causes that um, are treatable and reversible. So I think when a patient has these symptoms, it's really important to have a thorough workup. Look at the hormones, look for nutritional deficiencies. Iron deficiency is, is uh, often missed. Um, and also think about other comorbid diseases that could be contributing. Um, in addition, keep in mind that um, pain control, adequate sleep, and physical activity do impact uh, brain function very significantly and also impact energy levels. Um, so not just uh, attributing it all to the SIH. So talking about um, nutrition, um, the questions are, can diet reduce pain, uh, support the brain, and support tissue healing? And uh, I think we have good evidence to suggest that yes, the answer to each of those questions is yes. So the confusion with diet. Um, nutritional research is, is uh, not easy to do, and it's not easy to interpret. Um, every um, pr proponents of various diets all say that their diet is the best. You know, the vegans think that's the best. The paleo thinks that's the best. Um, so it's, it can be very confusing about what, uh, what diet to choose. But the reality is that, that one, one diet does not fit all, that it needs to be uh, matched to the patient. So what I do to uh, wade through the confusion is to focus on the um, aspects that we know um, are likely to make a difference based on the volume of data that we have in uh, nutrition science. So the five points here, the first one is that um, there's very strong data to show that a higher intake of flavonoids or plant-based nutrients correlates with risk reduction for all diseases. That's um, consistently true for neurologic disease, which we're particularly interested in. Um, it has an impact on, on pain, but really all, all diseases are impacted by a higher intake of, of plants. So that's one thing to think about. Um, too much sugar and processed grain um, produces insulin resistance, which impacts tissue repair. Um, we know that when we measure um, inflammatory markers in a large group of patients, we know that the higher the inflammatory level, the higher the pain score. 
So an anti-inflammatory diet uh, does impact pain. We know that high levels of inflammation also affect the brain, as well as many other chronic diseases. So three things so far, nutrient-dense diet, uh, limited sugar and flour products, and an anti-inflammatory diet are likely to make a difference. Um, most of you probably noticed that over the past couple of decades, there's been a huge amount of research focused on gut flora, um, the microbiome. Um, there, there is a definite link between the health of your gut flora and the health of your brain. And because your diet impacts your gut flora, um, keeping that in mind, um, taking care of your gut flora means that your gut flora is going to take care of you. So it's an important consideration. Um, when it comes to high fat, low fat, high carb, low carb diets, um, one size doesn't fit all. I think it's easier and more practical to think about the quality of each individual macronutrient, the quality of the fats, the quality of the carbs, the quality of the protein. Um, even though some people may do better on a high fat diet, um, it really has to be individualized. So focusing on the quality um, to enhance tissue repair. So with those considerations, um, the diet that I look to um, for, for most patients is the Mediterranean diet. Um, it it uh, happens to be the most well-studied dietary pattern, um, far more data with the Mediterranean diet than any other. Um, greater adherence to the Mediterranean diet lowers overall mortality, reduces cardiovascular risk, um, but also reduces the risk for almost every other disease we've measured. And um, certainly low levels of pain and disability are something that we see with greater adherence as people age. So it's important um, to think about it. When I um, prescribe diets um, for patients, I usually start with the Mediterranean diet because the volume of data, um, and then modify it and tweak it to customize it to the individual's needs because not everyone needs. So we can, I can adjust the macronutrient ratios, high fat, low fat, uh, eliminate um, certain parts of that diet if it needs to be like grains or, or um, dairy. This is um, a nice Mediterranean diet pyramid. Um, I'm not sure how well you can read the fine print. Um, I'd encourage you to go to the Old Ways website to just have a look at some extra information that they have. They've got some good resources about the Mediterranean diet. This is a summary slide. This little asterisk um, is an indication that it's a good reference slide for you. It basically summarizes the features of the Mediterranean diet. And without reading it, I just want to point out that it's um, high in, um, it's nutrient dense, lots of plants, um, anti-inflammatory, low in sugar and processed grains, um, includes some omega-3 fats, good for the brain. Um, the dairy that's included is uh, primarily fermented, which um, many people don't realize is correlated with a reduced risk of dementia. The next two slides summarize the, um, my advice on what to eat in general terms and what to eat in more specific terms. So in general terms, I think that Michael Pollan's uh, Eat Food, Not Too Much, Mostly Plants, um, summarizes the entire body of nutrition science pretty well. Um, it's, it's, a good, it's a good guide. So what he's referring to by eat food, he means unadulterated, minimally processed foods. As I mentioned, nutrient density is important. Um, paying attention to uh, trying to consume the widest variety of colors of plants as possible means that you're going to have a more nutrient-dense diet. Um, paying attention to the sugar load in your diet in terms of sugar and flour products. Um, trying to lean towards organic is preferable, if possible. The uh, avoiding or minimizing list is pretty obvious. Um, avoiding sweeteners, um, too much sugar, processed foods, trans fat, uh, fried foods because of the oxidized fats. This um, summarizes the more specifics about um, keeping variety in your plants, um, focusing on quality of the fats, quality of the, the uh, protein, quality of the carbs, but allows for the flexibility that I mentioned. Um, some people need to avoid dairy, some people need to avoid grains, some people choose to avoid other things that could be included in the diet. 
So it allows that, that flexibility, but still keeps within those goals that we talked about. Nutrient-dense diet, low in sugar, um, and um, paying attention to your, your gut flora. So I'm going to move on and talk uh, about physical activity a little bit, which is hard. <laughs> Um, I spent a couple, I spent almost two full years almost completely bedridden. <laughs> I was very deconditioned. So um, I know how difficult it, be, it can be to, to exercise. So upright posture being limited is, is obviously at the top of the list for, for challenges. Um, we have to avoid bending, lifting, twisting, stretching. Too much core engagement makes us worse. Bouncing and bumps isn't tolerated well. So it's not surprising that, that deconditioning is pretty difficult to avoid. Um, and it's also very difficult to reverse. Um, but uh, deconditioning is something we really do need to try to avoid because I think it contributes um, and amplifies the um, poor tolerance of upright posture. It decreases our ability to, to compensate physiologically for upright posture. We know that it worsens dysautonomy in patients that already had it, and we also suspect that it may uh, cause secondary dysautonomia until the leak is fixed. Um, so deconditioning is at the top of the list of things to try to, to avoid or reverse. Um, impaired balance um, is a problem for some, and if it is, that, need, that should be addressed because falling downstairs isn't, isn't a good thing. Um, a strong core probably supports intracranial pressure, but we have to limit core exercise. How do you do core exercise? So that's, that's a challenge. Um, so beyond the um, issues with deconditioning, balance for some, uh, trying to support core strength. This is a summary slide of the long list of, of um, positive health outcomes from maintaining physical activity. And I think these are relevant to anyone, but for the SIH patient, I've highlighted in pink the things that are of particular relevance uh, in terms of brain support, uh, reducing pain, improving sleep, um, supporting our gut, improving energy, um, re reversing insulin resistance, which is important for tissue healing. So all of these things are, are pretty important reasons um, beyond the deconditioning that um, I think trying to include physical activity is important. Um, so I mentioned aerobic conditioning, core strength, balance when needed. Um, muscle strength um, may, may have some importance um, in terms of uh, helping with upright posture. When you have um, good muscle strength and in the lower extremities, it does help to improve blood return. Improved blood return allows you to get more blood up to your brain and, uh, and support upright posture. So the goals, really, of exercise are not just more upright time uh, and less pain, but also the benefits for the brain uh, improving balance and energy. The problem is, what can we do? Um, because um, the, the list of restrictions is a little bit different from patient to patient, I think it's important for an SIH patient um, to work one-on-one -on -one with a physical therapist with a customized program. Um, remember that even if you're bedridden, there's some exercise that can be done. Again, a physical therapist can, can uh, help with that. Um, I found that if I exercised really in the early in the morning when my CSF tank was full, I tolerated it a lot better. Um, and using short sessions counts. Up and downstairs a couple times here or there, even when you're, when you're not able to be upright a lot. So under the aerobic conditioning category, which is the top of the list of priorities, um, the things that I was able to do um, included uh, walking with or without an incline, stair climbing intermittently, um, recumbent bike or stepper can be much better tolerated than upright exercise, particularly if, if you use one like this uh, with the back more reclined. Be careful not to use the arms. Um, and for, for most SIH patients, um, running, swimming, and rowing are really not great exercises because of the spine rotation. So pool running. <laughs> Some of you know that pool running is um, uh, an exercise that I think is ideal for SIH patients. Um, pool running uh, involves a treadmill at the bottom of a pool, so an underwater treadmill, um, water depth in the pool up to the shoulders um, in order to have enough compressive force on the body to increase intracranial pressure. 
such that uh, when you're exercising in the water, you tolerate better than exercising on land. Most of them have um, resistance jets that increases the workload, so you can get a better cardiovascular workout. Um, but those jets also push you off balance a little bit and help to work a little bit on balance and a little bit on core. So this is a little video clip of, of pool running, just so you can see the depth of the water, the water jets, and um, the treadmill at the bottom of the pool. So I've been doing this a couple times a week for about 10 years, uh, after that two years of being almost completely bedridden. Um, so, and, and you know, it, not everyone has access to one of these types of pools, but there are quite a few across the country. Um, there's still some value in doing um, water therapy or even walking in a pool if it's the right depth. But if you can have access to one of these, I think it's, I think it's particularly good at um, reversing deconditioning and, and sort of not allowing deconditioning contribute um, to, uh, to the orthostatic intolerance. So I mentioned balance and core. Um, this particular balance trainer can be really helpful at working both of those things, and physical therapists can give you a bunch of exercises to do. On this slide, I just want to emphasize that stretching is something that um, many of us need to avoid because of the traction on the spinal dura, um, and also because those with heritable disorders of connective tissue, um, stretching around their joints may, might be um, problematic as well. And the interesting thing is that um, exercise that's well-suited for SIH patients um, is also well-suited for dysautonomia patients. Um, I think I mentioned before that um, a percentage of people with SIH also have dysautonomia. Um, we're not sure how many. We need to do more search to find that out. But whether you have uh, SIH, POTS, or both, um, these exercises really um, can, can be helpful at improving the amount of upright time that you have. So that is the end of part one. Um, let's take a break, take our break, and uh, I'm going to come back and um, talk some more about supplements and about uh, mind-body medicine and how that, that can have an impact. And uh, questions we'll probably save until later on this afternoon. We have a question and answer period. That's all right. <laughs>